Lucy, Mark, come in. Professor Small, where are you now? We have arrived at our destination. We are now in orbit around the moon. See for yourself. And if you look carefully, I think, yes, there we are. I see footprints. Footprints? Yes, I knew we'd find aliens. In your face, Lucy. No, Mark, don't forget that the moon is the one other place in the solar system that humans have been to. Mankind first landed on the moon in 1969, and they last went back there in 1972. Now, because the thin atmosphere on the moon is really unusual, there is no wind or rain. Therefore, the footprints originally left by astronauts over 40 years ago will still be visible. Why hasn't anyone gone to live there yet? Well, the thin atmosphere also means... Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Boiling bogies and busted lungs. I get it. Why are they bouncing like that? Oh, well, the gravitational pull of the moon is only one-sixth of that of Earth. So the astronauts only weigh a sixth of what they did on Earth. But... what? Well, <laughs> Before your brain explodes, let's let the professor answer this bit. It's so horrible. Hello, ladies. I'm Professor McTaggart, and this is my brain dump on gravity. Everything in the universe pulls everything else towards it. We call this force gravity. The bigger a thing is, the stronger its gravity. The Earth, for example, is huge, and its gravity is very strong. That's why we all stick to the Earth. We're held in place by its gravity. Even small things have gravity, like you. But unlike the Earth, you aren't very big, so your gravity isn't very strong. The Moon is smaller than the Earth, so its gravity is weaker. Which is why, if you want to lose weight in a hurry, your best way is a quick trip to the Moon. Oh, oh, nearly lost my balance. <laughs> it's so horrible. Get up. Mark. Bob, I need you to keep the energy in the studio up. Woo -hoo -hoo! Yes, everybody! Here we go! Thomas Malthus in the house! Yes! Yes! Love that snow scooter. Just get on with the interview, Mark. All right, OK. Blah, 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 blah. Thomas Malthus, blah, blah, blah. Born 17... 66, died 1834, blah, 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 studied human population. What did you find? I theorised that every year the number of humans on the planet doubles. Cool. No, not cool, because the food available through farming the land does not double. It only increases a teensy weensy amount. I predicted that humans were heading toward a catastrophe of famine and disease that would wipe them out. Whoa! Whoa, wow, dramatic! Famine and disease! Woohoo! Sounds like the sort of day I'm having if you swap the word humans with snow scooter. Stay on topic! But I was wrong. Humans have not been wiped out. Oh, bad luck. I mean, great. No, no. I failed to predict the great scientific and engineering advances that would beat disease, revolutionise farming, and keep the huge human population alive. Oh, so it's all worked out then. Is it only me who lost out? Ah, no. Because every year, the human population increases by another 80 million. The planet can only provide for so many humans. And so I still believe that humanity is facing a catastrophe. It's all woe. Oh, the future sounds awful. What's the point in living? I don't even have a snow scooter for comfort. We have a code three. Presenter down emotionally. Alert! His face seems to be leaking. Oh! Somebody do something! There, 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 there. It's, it's not all that bad. I, I, I could be wrong. Maybe. I mean, humans have proved to be an ingenious species. I can't believe I'm saying this. You know, maybe we'll learn to cope, recycle more, put limits on people pumping out CO2, find new fuels. Really? So we're going to overcome food shortages, defeat global warming? And I might get my own snow scooter. Definitely. Maybe. <laughs> yes! I love you, Malfi. You're my new Bessie. Put it there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One love. True that. <laughs> ah! The catastrophe klaxon! Whoa! Whoa! Sorry, it's, it's this way, isn't it? Whoa!
So how do we know what these tiny creatures look like? Well, we've got a famous scientist from history to share with us his discoveries. Please welcome Robert Hooke. Mr. Hooke, thanks for joining us. Yeah, the honour is all yours. It's not often you are permitted insight into the finest scientific brain in history. Who? Oh, yeah, you, of course. <laughs> so you were one of the first people to look at these tiny creatures in detail. Yes, with the aid of my magnificent microscope. <laughs> right. I was able to describe and draw minute creatures and, and plant cells, which I collected in my stunning book, The Micrographia. It was, of course, a bestseller. <laughs> Let me read you some of the reviews. <laughs> Five stars. Uh, never before in the history of scientific endeavours. Yeah, we're what? actually a little bit pushed for time. How about you just show me some pictures instead? Well, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, here you can see a detailed engraving of the eye of a drone fly, or um, yeah, it's the body of a flea, or uh, oh, and this is a particular favourite, a louse. Oh, ah, look at the oh. detail. Look. Is that really what they look like? Yes, exactly. Before me, no one had any notion of the appearance of these creatures. I truly moved the very boundaries of human knowledge, defining for all time. Sure. Now, you had a little bit of a reputation for being a bit of a... for having a high opinion of yourself. Of course. <laughs> I was the finest mind of my age. And you didn't think much of the other scientists around at the same time. <laughs> Bunch of feeble fools. There was no one to compare to me. But isn't it true you lived at the same time as Isaac Newton? Isaac Newton? All I hear about is Isaac Blooming Newton. He was a nincompoop. Oh, just because an apple fell on his head. I tell you what, if I claimed I'd made a scientific discovery every time someone lobbed a bit of fruit at well, me... Well, we're going to have to wrap it up there. But before we do, can I have a look down your microscope? <laughs> yes, of course. Yeah, yeah. If you just look through here, you should be able to observe the red spider mite, one of the more common microscopic creatures. <laughs> <laughs> my microscope! Sorry. You... My bad. Sorry. My microscope. Sorry. You... Sacrilege! Mr Hook, I'm so, so sorry. Please accept this as a replacement. It's a modern microscope, far more powerful than the ones you had in the 17th century. <laughs> I don't know. Uh... I don't think you could ever truly replace these. Perhaps you'd also like to take these with you. What's this? It's a, a bag of um, tiny, as yet undiscovered bear-like creatures. Yes. <laughs> this will make me more famous than Newton. <sighs> Finally, my name will live on through the ages. Thanks for joining us, Mr Bell. Have you come far? Uh, from 1887. Not that far then. So, Mr. Bell, why don't you tell us a little bit about an invention of yours that changed the world? <laughs> Which one? <laughs> uh, telephone dude, obviously. Fine. You know, I invented the metal detector as well. Why does nobody ever want to talk about that? Huh? Great. Why don't you tell us a little bit more about how the telephone works? Well, you speak into this cone-shaped mouthpiece, and this electromagnet here turns the vibrations caused by your voice into electric pulses. Ah, so it works a little bit like the bones inside your ears? Um, well, yes, I suppose it does. Nice one, Mark. We'll make a scientist of you yet. Ding, ding. I mean, please carry on. Right. And then the pulses travel along the wire to the other end where they meet another electromagnet and whereupon they are converted back into vibrations and amplified by another cone. And then we can hear it. That's amazing. Can you tell us a little bit more about the first phone call you ever made? Uh, no, no. I mean, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't really remember it, to be honest. <laughs> really? Apparently you phoned your assistant and you said, Mr Watson, come here, I want you. Why did you say that? I, I, it, was, it was a long time ago. I, I don't, um, <clears throat> don't remember. Uh, now, metal detectors are extremely interesting. I've got a very funny story. Yeah, I think we've actually got some film footage of your very first phone call here. No, no, you, you don't need to show that. That's... Apparently, the transmitter of your original phone had to be filled with acid in order to work. One day, you spilt some on your trousers, then you shouted for help, and your assistant heard you through the telephone. So the first phone call was actually made by accident. Uh, maybe. 
metal detectors. Like I what say. What did he say next? Help, help! This acid is dissolving my trousers! Right, that's it! I hate telephones! You know, even after I invented them, I would never have one near me. They're too much of a distraction. I can't stand the noise! Metal detectors. Now, those are nice and quiet, let me tell you. I've just got one more question, Mr. Bell. Mr. Bell! Mr. Bell! Hi! Hi, hello! Hi, Mr. Bell. Since you painted it the first working electric loudspeaker, I thought you might like to hear what speakers sound like here in the 21st century. Bob, please do not do what I think you're about to do. Don't worry, no. Mark. No! No! Thanks Bob, to you, no. Mr. Bell, we're able to do cool stuff like this. <laughs> The 21st century is so noisy! I'm getting out of here! Just Bob, stop it! You're not quickly writing things up before we all burst an eardrum! Got it. Well, that's about it. All the science this week. Playing us out is a song all about sound. Prepare yourself for an insane look at what they don't tell you in the science books. From inner space to the universe, we're on a case to face the worst. It's icky and it's whiffy and it's yucky and it's squishy, but we love it.